like from my personal experience, being an instructor is a really fucking tough job. Really tough. It sounds so cool because it's like basically a rock star lifestyle, but you're under a lot of pressure. You're constantly tired. You're constantly fucking jet lagged. I was on four world tours. I had I, I had years where my last day, my, like my last working day was the 23rd of December. And my first working day was the 1st of January. You brought it up and we're going to skip around a little bit. RSD yeah. blowing up is the number. I got probably 40 questions about this one thing. And nobody's really publicly stated. I don't know how comfortable you are, how much you're willing to talk about this. But you are one of the, the you mentioned before, you had made, we're making the most revenue out of any of the coaches at RSD. For those people who don't know Real Social Dynamics, uh, they made a huge pivot where they were teaching dating. They're very happy in the pickup community, heavily, heavily criticized, and then uh, uh, rotated over into, I believe, they're doing self-help stuff now. What was your experience like there as a coach initially, and then what happened afterwards? I mean, dude, like, my experience has been epic. Like, I think back to these times very, very fondly. It was both the hardest time of my life, as well as the craziest time of my life. And, like, honestly, like, it's such a bizarre experience, like to teach dating and personal development. And like, I was fucking what, 20, 23 years old when I started. And like, <laughs> all of a sudden they're like, you're going to travel the world. You're going to be on world tours. You're going to give seminars in front of like 500 people. And you're going to have this YouTube channel and you're going to do all these things. And you know, it, it was a very big dream of mine for many years. And then you know, I, I was, I mean, there's so much to unpack. Uh, and, and these guys were my heroes, you right. know, Jeffy, Tyler, Julian, um, back then also Brad, Alex, and so on and so forth. And they still are, they're good friends of mine now, but, but back then it was like these like unattainable gods. And I look up to, I watched all the videos, total fanboy. And then, uh, I mean, I wrote, I wrote, a lot of uh, diary back then as well. I have diary entries of like, I'm sitting in the airplane next to Todd. I can't believe it. It's unreal. You know, and he's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Uh, me too. Literally, I was like, like, I'm in a nightclub in Vegas next to Todd. I was doing the same thing you were. <laughs> exactly like you were. Yeah. Literally, literally shit like that. And um, no, I'm kidding. And but then, yes, I love Todd. Yeah, I got you. <laughs> yeah, if, Todd's a great guy. Yeah. And, and then, and then, and then being one of them, and I'll never forget it was in Vegas. I had been six months of an unpaid assistant. Um, you know, my shoe, my shoes had holes in them. I was malnourished, probably <laughs> notoriously underslept. Um, and and they're like, "Yeah, Max, you're gonna have a you, we're gonna have a a business meeting with you." And I thought, like, you know, as an assistant, I've attended business meetings, but there was nobody else. It was just me, Nick, the CEO, and Tyler, the co-founder. And they're like, and Nick in his typical Nick manner he's like frowny face he's like we're, we're gonna have you become the new instructor you're gonna go on a first world tour starting next week blah, blah, blah. and i'm just like what <laughs> um and i was like in my uh, to the outside i was like oh okay yeah i can do it on the inside i was like crazy freaking out for joy because it was the unattainable dream there's like hundreds of guys who wanted to have the same job and i remember walking home from vegas in vegas from from the whatever steakhouse we were in to, to the hotel. I was staying at the Westin and it was like 7 a.m. Sun was going up. I saw the big Ferris wheel and I'm like this, I'm in the dream. I do not, um, I do not believe. I this believe, is. I believe the steakhouse was in the Venetian and I think I was there. I think, was that oh, the really? time Brandon Carter? Was Brandon Carter there? Was that that time? I think so. Yeah. I, dude, I, I mean, might've also actually sure. been you. Yeah. Because a lot of the stories you tell about being an intern, I was there for a lot of those things. So I, I that's why the story is so interesting to me. Uh, so can you talk about, uh, so uh, we'll go over what RSD is and explain it. Uh, we'll get to the background of that. But I think the thing people have asked the most specifically, so I want to ask you this first, the, the, the transition from there, you are a instructor there, there is a company there, and then things start to change. Where do things start to, for lack of a better word, unravel? Is it something that happens with you? Because obviously, you know, Todd leaves in a very, very explosive way. Uh, and then several other, the instructors leave. Can you talk a little bit about what happened there? So I, I was never really in the loop of what happened with the other instructors. There's always two sides to it. Yeah. Like to be fully transparent, like I was just fucking busy trying to crush it as much as I can. Like I was, I've never been much into drama, but especially back then I was just like, 
just next video, next product, next client, just crush it, crush it, crush it, crush it. Like I was obsessed with just becoming the best because I kind of wanted to prove it to myself and to others as well. And then, so it was like, I'm not sure what happened with Todd. I'm not sure what happened with, with the other guys that left before me. But if I had to guess, it's like from my personal experience, being an instructor is a really fucking tough job. Really tough. It sounds so cool because it's like basically a rock star lifestyle, but you're under a lot of pressure. You're constantly tired. You're constantly fucking jet lagged. I was on four world tours. I had, I, I had years where my last day, my, like my last working day was the 23rd of December. And my first working day was the 1st of January. So it's like, I would be home for like seven days and right. then boom back on tour, just nonstop. Right. So I, I like, and then the problem is like, as an instructor, you're, you're good at what you do. If you are arrogant, if you're a little bit cocky, like, and then of course I can get that there's probably some sort of conflict somewhere, but then what happened then before I left, like for me, it was just kind of like a natural transition because I was doing my RZ Max dating program, which was the high ticket mentoring program, which worked very well. And then we said, oh, you know, all these people asking about business and I've been thinking about teaching business because it kind of like became my second passion. So I was just like starting to do that on the side. And then there was some structural changes that were not really in the favor of instructors because what I felt was like RSD brought on another CEO. Also in, in, in a very, in a very, uh, the intention was very good because it was also me who kept pushing for more structure in the company. I'm half German. I was like, we need more structure. We need more rules. We need better budgeting. We need all this. And RSD was like, okay, we hear you, Max. Let's go hire another CEO. But I feel like that CEO didn't really get the culture and didn't really have the instructors in mind. And then there was this, I was not happy with that anymore. And, and then on top of that, I said, look, I'm already transitioning anyways into the business thing. So I said like, you know what guys, you know, like, like I don't want to teach dating anymore. It's been on my mind for a while now. Anyways, let's just part in a friendly manner, which we eventually did, which was very nice. I'm very happy about that. And then, but then I started doing the business thing. And then after that things started to pit, really they started to pivot around away from the day. It was like literally right after I had left. Yeah. They were like, okay, I don't know. I don't know their reasoning for that, whether they just want to do that anyways, or whether my departure had kind of like contributed to that. But it was like right after I left. Did you, uh, and from my understanding, it had to do with the change in culture basically on YouTube and in the world in general, uh, a lot of me too stuff. Did you, did you notice any of that pressure from you personally? I mean, I'm not going to talk about specific in incidents, but like there were not, not with you, but obviously with other people that were worldwide fucking incidents. Uh, did, did, did you feel any pressure from that to ca cause you to want to not teach dating anymore? Or was it just something, just a natural internal transition? Mm, not so much to be fully honest, because at that point I was, we were anyways going into a direction where we would say like, we want to be more in inclusive. I remember we had uh, RSD Sarah back then as the first female instructor, yeah, she, I which I thought was a cool, yeah, wonderful, which I thought was really cool because she was a very, very uh, outgoing personality. And I think she, she really would have fit in very well there. So I didn't really feel a lot of pressure because my mind was just like, okay, let's do the business thing. That was something I was so passionate about. And then to be honest, like nowadays, I have clients to want to do in the dating niche. They want to go in there. And I always tell them like, do not go into the crazy game niche Instead, make sure that you stay a little bit more uh, uh, politically correct because I think the other thing just doesn't have much of a future anymore. Can you can you talk about the crazy game niche? This is a, another big thing that you know there was a, a transition from you know I never I never taught pickup I, I you know but I know a bunch of people obviously did walk going around in Los Angeles every night you know I'd see them every freaking night right I go to yeah. I'd go to concerts I'd bump into Neil Strauss I'm at Mystery like all these people just like walking around out there and I'm just curious like something happened what I feel happened where like kind of predatory marketing maybe after 2010 I don't mean to br blame one guy but like Mike Long he started you know doing these these uh, uh, emails where the, the promises were just outlandish and things started to get a little <laughs> yeah. bit, for lack of a better term, predatory or aggressive. Did you see that uh, that niche, try to avoid that niche? Did you see it personally in, in, in your own experience? 
I mean, for me, it was just never something that resonated with me. This whole like predatory thing I was, and I, I hope also that that's kind of like my legacy that I'm known for when it comes to the dating stuff is like, my thing was always like, improve yourself, get better, have epic experiences, go on an adventure, you know, treat like life as if you're kind of like a character in a movie and you make it your own movie. And you know, life is a blank canvas. You can paint it. It was more like about that side of things. And of course, you know, being able to walk up to a girl and be confident is part of that because, you know, I grew up extremely shy in you know, 5,000 people cow town in Austria. There's not many opportunities for, you know, like a teenager to get his first experiences in. And I felt like that was very constricting me. I felt like, okay, like there's no way in hell a guy like me would ever, you know, get a beautiful girl to like him. So for me, I was always, I was projecting my own journey onto my brand. And I say like, look, if you don't feel good enough, go out, work on yourself until you become good enough. And if you're intimidated because a girl is beautiful, see that as a good sign. You know, it's like my girlfriend right now, I was intimidated as hell before I went on a date with her. I actually thought I met her on Tinder, funny site. And I thought she was catfishing because she, she looked too good. And I was like, no way. This is a real girl. You know? So I, that was always kind of like what I was, what I was, sticking to and what I was kind of like wanted to be known for. I seen that predatory marketing and I was like, okay, that's interesting. And I could see it work, but I never thought like I want such guys in my program. Right. Right. Yeah. Because in order to resonate with, with, with predatory marketing is like, you have to be in a really strange state of scarcity of anger of, and I think that stems from this like weird, entitlement of like women should like me women should want to have sex with me but i'm always like i never came from this standpoint of of i deserve anything i was just like i don't deserve anything i just gotta work hard for it and that's kind of what my brand was standing for as well